have you missed? What I need you to understand is there is something that God desires to get out of you that the culture needs. Do it for the culture. Hey, God bless you, friends. Do me a favor. If you are excited to be alive, and that carries a different meaning in this day and age, if you are excited to be alive, just give me a thousand hearts right where you are. I'm going to say what I grew up hearing my mother say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. God has been doing some incredible things here at Rock City, and I mean this from the depths of my heart. I am standing on tiptoe anticipation to see what he does next. Now, I don't know who I'm talking to right here, but I pray somebody has a little faith. I want you to type next. No, I want you to shout it right where you are. Shout next. Anybody can praise God for now. It takes another level of faith to shout for what's next. Just go ahead and have church with me wherever you are. I'm speaking by faith. My next will be greater. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered the hearts of men. The great things that God has in store for me next. Somebody, wherever you are, just shout next. We, we've been in this series entitled Do It For The Culture, and this is so tantamount to what I feel God is calling us to do as a corporate body, as a corporate body, cor corporate, I got a tongue tie, corporate, am I saying that right? Corporate body. I want to talk about this and really quickly, and this is, this is as loud as I'm going to get. This is is as loud as I'm going to get. Why, Pastor Mike Jr.? I want to make sure I'm grounding our church. Now, do me a favor. Right there at the bottom of your screen, you see it. I want you to take really good notes right there. You have two seasons. You have gathering seasons and you have grounding seasons. Gathering is when we're evangelistic in nature. We're trying to reach as many souls as possible. We're trying to fill the church and fill the kingdom of God. This is why we go to arenas. This is why we hold concerts. This is why we're being evangelistic in nature. This is why uh, I'll speak more to this this weekend. Uh, we will be doing I Got It Friday. Friday. Do me a favor. I want you to take a picture of that right there because I need you to join what we're doing Friday. It's called I Got It Friday. I Got It Friday. I'm going to send you a link immediately following the service and I want you to click that link because I want to know what you're doing to let the world know and let God know that I'm a part of this mission to say, I got it. Are you going to help pay for somebody's lunch? Are you going to help buy your niece and nephew some clothes? Are you going to help fill up some gas tanks? How can you be a part of what it is God is desiring to do? Somebody ought to just type, I got it. I got it. See, I'm appalled and I said I wasn't going to get loud, but I'm getting excited right here. In order to be a blessing, it means God has already made you a blessing. Somebody should have caught that. In order to be a blessing, that means God has already made you a blessing. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but somebody ought to just type, he's talking to me. He's talking to me. Lord, make me a blessing. Ooh, let make me a blessing. How do you know you are where you need to be in God? It's when your prayers are not about what God can do for you, but what God can do through you. Somebody type, I got it. I got it. So, so I, we go through gathering seasons and grounding seasons. I, I really want to challenge our church today and kind of ground us in the mission, the mission of who we are. Now, this is on the screen, and I want you to take really, really good, really, really good notes because I change our mission statement, and this will be the mission statement uh, for the foreseeable future until, I guess, the new pastor comes long after I'm gone. That's what, 75, 80 years from now when the next pastor comes and they decide to change the mission if God gives him a different vision. But here, here's what I want to share with you. Love God, love people, mad, make a difference. That's our mission. That's at the heart of who we are. That is not copy and paste. That is not the lingo of the month. That is not the popular thing to do. I really want to share with you, Rock City exists to love God, love people, make a difference. It's very clear. We have been spending two and three years trying to figure out how to succinctly summarize who we are. 
and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Let's just say what we do. We love God, we love people, and we make a difference. And in order to uh, make a difference, it starts at the genesis of loving God. Now, I want to say this, and I pray somebody uh, can receive what your pastor is about to say. Why, PMJ? A profession of love without demonstration is empty. A profession of love without demonstration is empty. So somebody type, somebody shout, love God. Okay, what am I saying, PMJ? I know I love God by how I demonstrate. Ooh, that's good right there. So I want to ask you a question. If you have not demonstrated your love for God, then your profession of your love of God is empty. This is the equivalent of being in a relationship with somebody and they constantly tell you, hey, baby, I love you, but never sacrifice anything for you. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wreck like you and me. That's love. What they were saying is the demonstration of my love for you is housed in my ability to sacrifice something. Oh, somebody shout sacrifice, sacrifice. What does that mean, PMJ? I am pushing those who call me pastor, who call me spiritual teacher, rabbi, who call me leader. I am saying that I want the sum total of your relationship with God to be the demonstrations that you do for him him, i.e., for example, I sacrifice. Yeah, I sacrifice. And, and I mean this from the depths of my soul. I love God. And my love for God can be seen in how I serve. My love for God can be seen in how I worship. My love for God can be seen in how I sacrificially give. My love for God can be seen on how I spend devotion time with him. I want you to catch this. Love is when you intentionally put something or someone before you. Please put that in your notes. Love is when you intentionally put something or someone before you. Somebody say demonstrate, okay? Let's talk about this. So I want to challenge and convict you right here. I want you to make this statement with me, and I need you to do me a favor. I want the comments to go crazy. As you can see, the sanctuary is completely empty right now. We've been allowing people to come in this week leading up to Easter. I said, shut it down. Everybody take somewhat of a Sabbath. Make sure you're in a place because this weekend, we are about to bombard this world with demonstrations. Now, I want you to see the subtle change. For years, I would say, we're about to love this city. But now I understand Rock City is just bigger than Birmingham. Do me a favor. Devo energy style. Throw your city in the comment right there. I want everybody on the stream to see the impact of the ministry. Because sometimes you can be so uh, locked in on what you know to be something that you miss what God is actually. Do you see that? Put your city, put your state. In the comment right there, it would be insane. Do me a favor, if you don't mind, that graphic that you see right there on the screen, that is the impact of where Rock City is right now. 50 states, we have people now worshiping with us. You can see that's Dubai right there. People are from South Africa. The world is tapped in to what God is doing right here at Rock City Church. We are not just about to shake Birmingham for God. And I need somebody to get excited with me. We're about to shake this world for God. Oh, I can't say shake this world. Let me do it Rock City style. Somebody just taught rock the world. We are about to rock the world this weekend for God. How, Pastor Mike? Not by holding a mega conference, not by a mega CD release, not because we're about to go on tour. We are about to rock the world because each one of us are about to demonstrate. Yeah, I'm telling you right now, this weekend, Friday in particular, I got it Friday. What would happen if all of you at the end of the week, more than 20,000 people, 30,000 people view our messages between all of our digital platforms? What would happen if 30,000 people didn't even go out of their way, but would just say, wherever I am Friday, I'm going to be a blessing? 
I wish somebody would just put a hands up in the comment and say, Pastor Mike, I got it. I got it. I got it. I see it now. It is demonstration. So here's what I need from you. How do I demonstrate PMJ? Here's three phases. I love God. I love you. I love my church. That's critical. That's how you embody the mission of Rock City Church. Number one, I love God. My, my love for God is unquestioned. Yes, it's a lot on the internet that tries to pull me out of it. I cannot believe the lie that Christianity was forced upon Africans during slavery when facts prove that Christian, thousands of years before slavery in Africa, Christianity was thriving. Christianity is not a white man's religion. Can I free you real quickly? Sometimes we team to discredit the facts because of the presenter. Sometimes we tend to discredit the facts because of the presenter. Let me give you an example. If I told you my mom loves me, she loves God, she sings in the choir, she's the best mother and grandmother on the face of the planet, but she also told me that the Bible was just a fictional book and I shouldn't believe it because you heard the good facts about my mother, you would say, well, that has to be true. Conversely, if I told you an axe murderer called me and said, I opened up that book and everything in that book saved my life and it changed my life, you would then discredit the evidence based off of the presenter. Some of us don't even go to certain restaurants because the presentation isn't right. It's some people on the internet right now who could preach me under a bridge who's deeper than me, more charismatic than me, more anointed than me. And when you see them on your timeline, you don't even click it because the presentation isn't right. So what happens is they are trying to get us to believe that the evidence that God is a good God, that Christianity is the only way. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man coming to the father but by me. They're trying to get us to believe that that is not authentic because there was a misrepresentation or the presenter used or misused the gospel. No, I love God. Uh, I love God. I, I mean this from the depths of my soul. I love God with all of my heart. I am the living proof that God is still a good God. I am the living proof that God is still making ways out of no ways. I believe he sits high and he looks low. I believe I have a God that sympathizes yet provides. Yes, I do. And I also believe I have a Lord that giveth and a Lord that taketh away. I love God. So that means my theological stance is God is my God. He is my rock and my salvation. It is him that I lean and depend on. I love God. I love people. Number two, I love you. Now, that's difficult. You want to know what I discovered? I've discovered that it's easier to love God than sometimes it is to love people. Michael, it is easier to love God than it is sometimes to love people. Why, Pastor Mike? Because I've discovered loving God tends to be easy because I can choose when I want to interact with him. I can paint the picture of the God I like. Many of you know that one of my favorite movies is Talladega Nights when they're sitting at the kitchen table and they get into a theological joust or they get into a theological argument about who Jesus is. And he says, well, I want to just pray to sweet little baby Jesus. Then his brother Kyle says, that's, that's not Jesus. I kind of picture my Jesus in a tuxedo shirt that says, I'm formal, but I'm also here to have fun. But, but sadly, that's how many of us see God. Some of us, those of you who grew up somewhat Pentecostal of holiness, you kind of view God through this uh, dictator or th this, this law only Old Testament God that everything you do is evil. Now, don't, don't wear no makeup. You're going to go to hell. Don't do this. You're not going to make it into heaven. But then some of us new school saints who kind of see the grace, we tend to lean too far right and say, well, I can do whatever I want to do. His grace is sufficient. So sometimes how you interpret Christ determines how you love Christ. How you interpret Christ determines when you interact with Christ. So if I believe God is this big, bad, mean father in heaven who smites me because I make mistakes, I only run to him when I'm wrong. If I think he's this cool God who doesn't care about much stuff, his grace is sufficient, I only run to him when I want something. I have to have a balanced approach that he will whoop me, but then he will also hug me. 
That's for every father who's had to discipline your child. Miles, cut the fool at school this past week. I had to go up to the school, check him out, and I had to pop his little butt and say, boy, you will not say no to your teachers like that. He ran out the classroom, ran around the hallway. I said, boy, you won't act like that. And after I got through popping his butt, gave him a big old hug, got him some ice cream and said, now let's talk about it. Why, PMJ? God is not just a God of hard lessons. He's also a God of hard love. And hard love sometimes feels like hard lessons. So what I'm trying to get you to realize is many of us run from God or it's easier to love God because I can choose when I interact with him. And for many of you, loving God is easy because you only have to deal with him on Sunday. Michael, see, I should have had somebody in the room today. Church would be going crazy. So if I limit him to a Sunday guy, somebody type, I got it. What I'm trying to get you to realize is that the mission of this church is God is not just a day of the week. He goes where I go. So when I say I got it this Friday, I'm helping them see a piece of God. You don't know if somebody at that gas pump is putting their last three dollars in and depressed and frustrated. And then you walk up and just say, hey, put 10 on theirs, too. I got it. Hey, I'm getting ready to go to Wendy's for lunch this week. Do me a favor. You come with me. Don't worry about it. I got it. I want you to see that we can love God, love people. But I also, and this is so powerful to me, I love my church. I love my church. Pastor Mike, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I love my church. I, I, I mean this, that this church is not a perfect church. The people in this church are not angels and saints. They got issues just like everybody else. But I come alive. Oh, I, I feel like running in here today. And I promise y'all I wasn't going to raise my voice. But I come alive when I'm at Rock City Church. Whether I'm digital, physical or digital, I can feel the power of God. And sadly, when it comes to your relationship with God and your church, the question that I have or the statement I have to impress upon you is don't just tell me, show me. Don't just tell me. Show me. Somebody type, somebody shout, I got it. No, this Friday, I'm asking each and every one of you to join your pastor. We're going to be at several grocery stores throughout this city of Birmingham, blessing people. Imagine just being at the counter and somebody rolls up with their groceries and we got volunteers right there who say, don't worry about that. And we swipe our little card and say, on behalf of God and Rock City Church, I got it. I need some of you to sign up to volunteer today. There's the link right there in the comments. Save that link. If you don't mind, just pin that link for me because I don't want you to exit out of the message right now. I want you to be locked in tune to what I'm saying. Hear me when I say this. It is time for you to show it. Everybody does not need a platform. As you can see, this room is completely empty. It's empty. Maybe four or five people who are here who work here during the day. The room is empty. I want you to see if you're waiting on a crowd, it is if you're waiting on a crowd, it is revealing the intentions of your motives. If you're waiting on a crowd, it is revealing the intentionality of your motives. Don't just tell me, show me. Oh, that's good right there. What better scripture to talk about I got it than Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus replied with the story, a Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits. Look at that verse line. He is traveling on a trip, listen to this, from Jerusalem to Jericho. There was a traveler. The first thing we got to understand is this brother is foolish. Why? It was the favorite strip where thieves and different people would go to do evil. It was called the way of blood. That's critical. So I want you to see something because so many times when we open this scripture, the first thing we do is run to how there's a good Samaritan. Look at this. This story. Let me shift gears and slow down. This story is themed the good Samaritan. When I could remix it and call it, the foolish man, Jesus Christ. The only reason he need help is because he kept making stupid decisions. Jesus. I want to pause and parenthetically digress, and I'm going to sound somewhat antithetical to what I'm saying. I'm telling you this weekend, we're going to be a blessing to people all over this world and let them know I got it. 
But I also want to challenge some of y'all who always need it. Some of y'all always need it because you keep making foolish decisions. I'm not going to keep getting it for people who don't get it. Michael, I'm only preaching to seven of y'all who like, Pastor Mike, I got somebody in mind right now that I'm going to say I got it too. The only problem is I always got them. That ain't the person this week. No, this brother was foolish. Everybody who lived in this time knew you shouldn't take this road. I'm not from California. I'm not from Milwaukee. I'm not from Dubai. I'm not from South Africa. I'm not from Maryland, Texas, Detroit, or Chicago. I'm from Birmingham. There are certain places I know at a certain time do not go that way. Hear me, when I, when I go to the studio some nights and I have to go back home, I stay on the main road, get on the freeway. I'm not trying to cut through Gate City or do certain things. As a little kid, they taught me, we don't play the radio around here. I ain't, I ain't ashamed. I love my city. My city is known for Silver Rice and First 48. Can I get a what, what? <laughs> Birmingham, don't play. This brother was irresponsible. So I want to say this before we even talk about, I got it. Here's the first thing I need you to understand. Take full responsibility for your current position. I need you to take full responsibility for your current position. Where you are is where you are. Now, I want to always preach a balanced gospel because I also want to say in taking full responsibility for where you are, some of where you are may not be your fault. I am not saying take responsibility for what people did. No, there's a level of responsibility in there. If I keep picking the wrong person and they keep breaking my heart and I keep going back to them, there's a level of responsibility I have to take for my picking. But I'm not going to make an excuse for the abuse. This brother's, this brother's situation went from bad to worse because of his decision. He knew, don't take this way. He knew this was dangerous. And what I'm pushing you to realize is that many of us are reaching a place of maturity where we have to take full responsibility. Look at what it says. He went the wrong way from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked. Now, I want to bring up a couple words, all right? I want you to see this. Watch this. He was attacked stripped, beat, left half dead. Oh man, I wish they had that up top. Attacked, stripped, beat, left half dead. That's critical. I want you to see this now. We, we see some adjectives that describe this man's experience. Attacked, stripped, beat, left half dead. In this one scripture, I see two cultures. In this one scripture, I see two cultures. I see one culture trying to see what can I get. I see another culture trying to see what can I give. This text shows me two distinct cultures of people. What can I get and what can I give? And I want to ask you a question, which one are you? That's rich. Which one are you? Are you the type of person who's trying to get all they can? Or are you the type of person who's trying to give because they know when I give it, it comes back good measure. Press down, shaking together, running over two cultures. And what I'm trying to get you to realize right now is that this weekend we get this opportunity to show the world another culture. And I've been saying it for a month, I'll say it again. Do it for the culture. This weekend, this Friday in particular, Pastor Mike, what's your goal? I want to do a half a million dollars worth of love and donations this week. That's what I want to do. Between what the church is going to be giving and doing, between what you're going to be doing, wherever you are, I want to be able to say Rock City Church put a half a million dollars worth of love in the earth. Oh, that's a powerful statement. This is why after church, I need you to click the link so you can let me know what you did. I'm going to then take that because I'm not no fool. I feel like preaching. I'm not a fool. I'm going to take what we pledge to do all over this world this weekend. That then becomes an economic impact. I'm going to print that out and then show the government in our city, 
This is the economic impact. I'm going to show the government, the, 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 the powers that be that, hey, if you support a church that loves people, here's the economic impact. Because the problem with the church is the church is loud about stuff we ain't got no business talking about and silent in places we should be loud. So we want to argue about if Will Smith was wrong or not, but then we don't want to be God's will on earth. Oh, my God. I came to preach to somebody. This is our weekend to make a difference. This is our weekend to be loud. But the question is, which one are you? Are you a giver or a getter? Give it to me. No, no. Because, oh, my, I feel it. I see you. I, I heard you in the spirit. Somebody already negative. Just go ahead and log out and find another church where you can just go be messy and all that. Somebody in your heart right now already saying, forget helping people. Shoot, they can help me. What grocery store they going to be at? God's been good to you. Let me, whew, let me pause and parenthetically digress. I just need seven folk who can just say God's been good to me who can just go crazy in the comments and just hit a heart and just shout pastor when I think about it I still don't even have as much as I need but I'm still willing to be a blessing to somebody else because God has been good to me he's keeping me in perfect peace he's got my children healthy I may not be where I used to be but I'm a whole lot better than where I come from that when I look back over my life yes I would have made some better decisions yes I would have saved a little bit more yes I may not have went to this place or yes I may not have dated this person but in spite of all of the mistakes and the wrongs that I've done in spite of how good I've been in certain seasons it could have been better God has been good to me. So I have to be a blessing. It says, it says they left him half dead. Now, that's a beautiful statement. It, it, it has sort of what I call collateral beauty. Yeah, collateral beauty, half dead. It, it's, it's, a, it's a statement that, that is beautiful, but yet sickening. It, it is a statement that is refreshing, but also depressing. It's half dead. It, it means I'm not gone, but I'm still not all the way here. I'm, <laughs> I'm half dead. It is an adjective resembling death, death like a dead sleep, a dead faint, uh, barrette of sensation, numb. He was half dead, numb, half dead. Look at this. So, in other words, can I change that? They stripped him of his clothes, attacked him, beat him, look at this, and left him numb. <laughs> Michael, they left him numb. I wonder who's watching me right now that being a blessing to others is a challenge because I'm numb. Pastor Mike, the truth of the matter is when you preach this sermon about the Good Samaritan, I've been attacked, I've been beaten, I've been stripped, but didn't nobody come by to help me. I had to help myself. And so sadly, it's this idea of it's hard for me to help somebody wake up in them what's dead in me. It's hard for me to help somebody get to a place that I'm still not fully at yet. It's numb. So, so, so I want to talk about that. To be left dead means to somewhat be left numb. And, and I wonder who we're going to heal this weekend because when it comes to church, they're numb. You know, that, you know how them preachers are. You know how them pastors are. You, you, you know how these church folks are. Ah. But lo and behold, when we walk into a grocery store and bless them, they say, you know what? I needed a sign. I was numb. Wow, Jesus Christ. Half dead is this weird place that I'm not gone, but I'm still not all the way here. I'm sort of stuck in the middle. And what happens next determines. I want you to really see this. If he's half dead and this Samaritan comes by, if the Samaritan does not say, I got it, he dies. Jesus Christ. If the Samaritan does not say, I got it, this brother dies. I want to help somebody right here. Who you going to let die because you won't come alive? Mm -mm. Who you going to let die? Who you going to let die? 
I hugged a brother this past weekend uh, at our last service right after church, right here on the altar. And he said, man, you saved my life. And every time somebody says that to me, I almost get scared because that's a different level of responsibility, a different level of pressure. And I know what they mean. I really know it's God who did it. But what they're articulating is you introduced me to him or however they're saying it. So in all humility, I always say, man, to God be the glory. But I just think about, I went home that night and laid down and said to myself, had I stayed numb, would he have died? Can I help you real quickly? Come alive. Come alive. It was Howard Thurman who said, don't ask what the world needs, but rather ask what makes you come alive and do that. But what the world need now are people who have come alive. You don't know what it's like to come alive until you bless somebody. This Friday, you're going to come alive. Something in you going to say, man, Oh my God, not only am I giving to my local church, I'm tithing, but now I'm going above my tithe and I'm being a blessing. I'm being a blessing. See, I can't take my tithe and help somebody because now I'm making them my source. So the first thing I have to do is tithe to show God you're first. But then after I show God he's first, I can now show God, let me make it make sense. I tithe and say, God, I honor you. I give to them to say, God, and I honor what you created. Help me, Holy Ghost. I am telling you this weekend, come alive. That's critical. He was numb. So I, I, I was tripping because, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I'm running out of time. Oh, Lord, I'm scared to tell this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. All right, so please, if, if you ever been here, do not leave me by myself. I need all of my members in the comments right here to either put a laughing emoji or to just say, Pastor, me too, right here. Have you ever been in the restroom uh, sitting on the throne so long your foot go numb? Okay, uh, y'all gonna leave me hanging. And, and, and what you have to do, you have to, <laughs> you have to wake that thing up, right? It's, it's, it's the technical term for your foot going numb is called a sleeping limb. Your nerves are going a little haywire because prolonged pressure has actually cut off communication. Jesus Christ. It's called a sleeping limb. Your nerve, that tingling feeling that you feel in your foot, are your nerves going crazy because prolonged pressure has cut off, not feeling, you missed it, communication between the limb and the brain. Jesus. The tingling sensation is technically called paresthesia. Jesus Christ, paresthesia. It is the point before paralysis. <laughs> this brother is in a place called paresthesia. If I got a doctor or a nurse and I'm saying it wrong, charge it to my head, not my heart. So what happens is the reason the foot starts tingling is because it's telling the body, send a word. Michael. It, it, it says we haven't had communication in this place in a while. And if we go a little bit longer without communication, this ain't never coming back. Because when communication stops from the head to the bottom, that place becomes inactive. And many of you right now, you're, you're, the tingling sensation of irritation, the tingling sensation of frustration, the tingling sensation of irritability, the tingling sensation of now you're just angry and you can't get rest and just something feels off. Maybe the Lord saying, you ain't had no communication in a while. Can I free you real quickly? Can I free you real quickly? The brain doesn't tell you the foot's hurting. The foot tells the brain something's wrong. I want to free you real quickly. That's for those of y'all who keep putting pressure on God to send you a word when you out. No, the communication is restored not because God sends a word to you, but because you sent a word up. Michael, y'all miss what I just said. This is why in the Old Testament, he does not send a deliverer until they cry out. Michael McClure, the longer they stay silent, the longer they're going to be in their pain. See, I don't know who I'm preaching to. I need somebody who's watching me right now to send some communication. That this is why I can't be too far removed from my prayer life. This is why you see us now recruit more men and more individuals to be a part of the prayer team and the intercessory team. That we cannot put the pressure of a mega church that's reaching thousands of people on the shoulders of four people. No, we got to make sure we got the proper lines of 
communication. I grew I grew up in the hood, right? Grew up in the hood, and I never forget the first time I was able to use the phone. I gave this girl my phone number, and I never forget she called, and she called, and she called, and we would talk all night. But then the only problem, and you remember this growing up with the phone, is uh, if, if your mama needed the phone, she wouldn't ask if anybody was on the phone. She would pick up the phone, and you would be on the phone talking, and she'd say, boy, Get off this phone. Let me use my phone. All right, mama. All right. Let me hang up real quick. Hang up the phone, mama. Hang up the phone. All right, I'm going to call you right back, okay? And then I never forget, I met this girl. I never forget her name. Not going to say her name because she may be watching and think she still got a chance. Nope, too late. All right, so, so what happens now is I give her my number and I'm telling her, hey, make sure you call me tonight after seven when I finish my homework. That way we can talk. I get to school the next day. And she's like, hey, Mike, I ain't want nothing to do with it. I said, no, forget you. You played with my feelings. I was waiting on you to call me. Then she looked at me and said, I have been calling you all night the phone was busy now some of y'all like pastor mike she lying she for the streets she lying no she ain't back then we didn't have call waiting you had to pay for that that call waiting was a feature not a default michael and i want to argue that the culture sometimes conditions our relationship with christ See, back in the day, they had to cook everything and they had to prepare everything. So they, their, their prayer means would be called tarrying and tarrying mimic uh, marinating. Then when we became a microwavable generation, now our prayers are quick. Back in the day, if you didn't get through, the line would be busy, which means if you really wanted to talk, you had to keep asking or keep making effort. Now, the first ring, you can get somebody. And what I'm discovering now is many of us are missing God because we feel as if he didn't pick up on the first ring. Jesus Christ. And when communication goes out, things become dormant. Let me free you real quickly, help you real quickly. How do I know I'm numb and half dead? No communication with God. No communication with my man of God. Ooh, I'm trying to ground you this Sunday. No communication with God. No communication with my man of God. I don't know who I'm preaching. I need to hear a word from my pastor. Hear me when I say this. We were getting ready to record this. We were recording at 10 a.m. I'm recording this right now at 10 a.m. on a two Wednesday morning. It is 10 a.m. Wednesday morning. We did not start recording to 11 a.m. I had to spend 45 minutes on the phone in the car with my pastor. Started feeling a little low. I needed a word. Y'all miss what I just said. I needed a word. I needed a word. I needed a word. I needed a word. And I'm discovering that sometimes the enemy tricks you into believing two things. Number one, that you're not good enough or you're grown enough. Not good enough. Well, I, I can't pray. I've been out here living wild. Or I can't come to church to get a word from my man of God. I ain't been there in three months and I want nobody looking at me funny. Or I'm in my word just like he in his word. Yeah, I pray just like they pray. And if you're not careful, the devil will have you out here thinking you can preach all the time to yourself. One of the most misrepresented scriptures in the Bible to me is David encouraged himself. Can I free you real quickly? He encourages himself in that situation. But then in Psalms tell us all the times he had to ask for help. But pride makes you think that the one time he preached to himself is equivalent to the 150 times he called on God. I came to preach to somebody and submit and suggest to you that yes, there are seasons when I look in the mirror and say, Mike, lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting, and the king of glory shall come in. Michael, you are what God said you are. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But that does not compare to the millions of times I said, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help that I know. Yes, you should be strong enough to speak to yourself, but you should also be strong enough to tell God I don't have the strength because no doctor can operate on himself safely. Notice I didn't say successfully. No, this is why even when a barber goes to cut his hair and shout out to my barber, George, the ton serial master, even when he had to cut his own hair, I'll ask him, man, what took so long? I was cutting my own hair. I said, how would it take you 25, 30 minutes to cut my hair and an hour and 15 to cut yours? He said, I have to get the mirror right. I can't see the back of my head. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Many of us are missing valuable moments, wasted trying to fix yourself. 
Mm. I'm going to say it again. I've been saying it for three weeks. Here's the prophetic word. God is about to move at the speed of your obedience. He's about to move at the speed of your obedience. I want to go fast. Watch this. I want to go fast. This man is beaten and he's left for dead. And by chance, the priest came along. But when, this, when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road. Watch this. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there. And he also passed to the other side of the road. So I want you to see this. A Levite came. He went to the other side of the road. A despised Samaritan came along and felt compassion. You got church folk, people who know Christ. All of these people, hear me when I say this, had an opportunity to say, I got it. And made a decision. That ain't my problem. Jesus. Jesus. I wonder how many times you see somebody in need and say, you know what? That ain't my problem. I want to free you because this message could easily guilt you into helping people who don't, in my opinion, because I believe the devil will send people as a distraction. Let me pause. I'm going to be very balanced. I believe the devil will send people as a distraction. I believe, I believe the devil will see you trying to tithe, save, and live right and send a cousin who he know going to take you out of focus. I believe that. I am not telling you to be walking around here helping everybody who's in need. I'm telling you to do the things God placed on your heart. It is the assignment. Hear me when I say this. I don't give because I got it in my hand. I give because he put it in my heart. (laughs) Somebody ought to just type, it's in my heart. It's in my heart. It's in my heart. I want you to catch this now. The robbers treated him. I I want to say this, and I want you to see this, all right? There, there, there's a man who's been robbed, beaten and left, half dead. And it's critical because there's so many perspectives. The robbers treated him as an object to exploit. The priests treated him as an object to avoid. The Levite treated him as an object of curiosity, but the Samaritan treated him as a person to love. I want to ask you, which one of you are you trying to exploit, avoid, just curious or trying to make a difference? What you trying to do? This is why, this is why you're not going to see any press release go out that here's where Pastor Mike Jr. and Rock City Church is going to be because I'm not trying to do it for the cameras. I'm trying to do it for the culture. This is why I'm not trying to have Fox 6 News outside of every grocery store I'm going to be at. So now it's 3,000 people in line knowing I only got enough to only feed probably 55 families because I'm not trying to do it for the cameras. I'm trying to do it for the culture. Hear me when I say, and I believe when you do it for the culture, the cameras may come. But now I get to say, forget Rock City Church. If I, when I be lifted up, Jesus will draw all men unto us. The, 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 the priest, can, oh, I got to go. Can, can we be honest? If I was to tell you somebody was laying on the ground dying, wouldn't you think that the priest would be the one to stop? If anything, so what? He ain't got no money. He should have stopped and prayed. This is my issue. They didn't have to pay for everything. They literally could have just said, Father, in Jesus' name, come and keep him blessed. What did they do? They walked on the other side of the street, and this is my challenge to my counterparts, my brothers and sisters of other ethnicities who want multicultural, multi-ethnic churches who have no problem putting people who look like me on your flyer, but you are silent when they're dying. Stop walking to the other side of the street. Yeah, that's the issue I have right now, that we always walk to the other side of the tree. Conversely, when it comes to my African-American pastors who tend to shun from those in the LGBTQ community and different social issues that you feel like we shouldn't do, stop walking to the other side of the street. It may be controversial for you to speak your truth, speak your truth. You may get counseled for speaking your truth, speak your truth. But I told you last week, the culture can't counsel what God called. No, this is the season where the world is waiting to see what does the church have to say of relevance, but not just what the church has to say. What are you going to do 
Michael! And what I'm telling you is, I may not believe like you, I may not agree with you, but I will not be complicit on walking on the other side of the street. No, if I see somebody hurting, if I see somebody dying, if I see somebody losing faith, if I see somebody who's been exploited and abused and misused, it is the responsibility of those who call ourselves Christians to not run from the fire, but to run into it and say, hey, how can I be a blessing? The priest said it ain't my responsibility. The Levite said it ain't my responsibility. The robber said this is going to be a quick come up for us. And the Samaritan who is looked down upon, the Samaritan is what we would call a mutt. They would call him a half breed. He ain't all this and he ain't all that. That's just a Samaritan. This one person who ain't from church, who don't nobody like, is the main person trying to make a difference. God often sends help from unexpected places. And what I'm trying to tell you is, help me when I say this, what if you're the one that God is sending to be an unexpected blessing? Ooh, I'm finna have church by myself. I want to prophesy, get ready for unexpected but unprecedented blessings. Jesus, get ready for unexpected but unprecedented blessings. Get ready for somebody you didn't even think was thinking about you to think about you. Get ready for a door to open that you didn't even see coming. Can I prophesy? God's getting ready to open doors you didn't even knock on. You finna get calls from people that you thought didn't even like you. I want to speak that your testimony in the next six months going to be, you'll never believe who I just got off the phone with. And they say it blank, blank, blank. And I'm sitting here like, if I can be honest, I didn't even think you like me. God said, I am getting ready to send you unusual kindness. Somebody ought to praise God that unexpected blessings is get ready to knock on your door. Unexpected blessings are about to show up in your bank account. Unexpected blessings are about to be on your doctor's report. Unexpected blessings are about to find your bloodline. Unexpected blessings are about to come into your children's life. Unexpected blessings are about to turn your career all the way around. Unexpected blessings. I don't know who I'm preaching to right here, but I got a feeling that God's about to do something exceeding mm. and abundant above all you could ever ask, think, dream, or imagine and not only is he doing it suddenly he's sending it unexpectedly I don't know who I'm preaching to in here but I need somebody in the morning to just walk to your mailbox like you expecting something I need somebody to just check your online banking like you expecting something I need somebody to open your email like you expecting something because God is able mm, to do exceeding and abundant unexpectedly above all yeah I could ever ask think dream or imagine it comes from the unexpected the Samaritan is the least likely candidate to say I got it <laughs> and he says look at this verse 33 a Samaritan traveling the road came on him when he saw the man's condition his heart went out to him his heart look at me I want you to see the symbol symbolism his heart his heart what is our slogan at this church? Rock City Church, we have a heart for the city. City is, is a double entendre, the cities that we're in, but also the citizens, the people who are in Rock City, a heart. So look at this, his heart goes out to him. He gave, uh, we gotta go back, we gotta go back. I gotta stop, I'm over today. Look at verse 30. They attacked, stripped, beat, left half dead. But when the Samaritans show up, look at the adjective. He gave, he lifted, he led. Look at the scripture. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. And because the condition, listen to me, somebody type, somebody shout, I got it. He just didn't help him because he needed it. He helped him because his heart went out to him. I'm not asking you to just be out here being random. I'm saying if something touches your heart, or I tell you what, this, this is good. This is good right here. This is good right here. Pastor Mike, I'm going to be honest with you. You just do it. Well, if you're giving today, I want you to put in the line right there, I got it. To say, Pastor Mike, I know you're going to be a blessing, so whatever God lay on your heart, going to be a blessing. Look at what it says right here. 
His heart went out to him. Look at verse 34. I believe there's no waste of ink in the Bible. Pastor Darius, Pastor Tiffany, Pastor Curtis, there's no wasted ink in the Bible. No waste of ink in the Bible. Make that make sense. The only reason I'm still alive and I have a right to the tree of life is that Jesus said, I got it. I'll touch on that on Easter Sunday. He dies at the age of 33. And in verse 33, his heart went out to him. Look at the action of verse 34. He gave him first aid. Then he lifted him onto his donkey. Number three, he led him to an end. Uh, please remember that in case we ever have to do a pastor and leaders or any type of leadership training. That's the core scripture right there. He gave, he lifted, he led. This is my heart's desire for Rock City as a church and for all of you as citizens of Rock City personally. Don't put your nose in people's business without putting your heart into their problems. That's the quote of the day right there. Do me a favor to everybody right now who loves being nosy and loves gossiping. Do me a favor. Don't put your nose in people's business without putting your heart in their problem. The mission of Rock City is we exist to love God, love people, and make a difference. Right now, I need you to declare right now, I am a citizen of Rock City. I am a citizen of Rock City, and I'm ready to make a difference through my giving. I'm ready to make a difference through my lifting. I'm ready to make a difference through my leading. He gave first aid. He lifted him on his donkey. He led him to a hotel and made him comfortable. Giving, lifting, leading. Can I break that down? Giving my time, my talent, my treasure. I want to say it better. Giving my time, my talent, my tithe. Lifting, encouraging people, empowering people, and equipping people. Leading, instructing, inviting, and investing. So when I give, I give my time. I sacrifice this weekend and say, hey, I'm going to be a part of this. For those of you who are going to volunteer, you're giving your time. My talent, these are those who you see on these cameras right now. D. Jerome, one of the best photographers in the world, if you need your pictures, he does that. That's his talent. He's giving his talent back to the ministry. My tithe, that is biblically 10% of your increase. When God puts something in my hand, the minimum for me, 10% is coming back to God through my local church. What's my local church? Not just the place that I'm on roll at, but the place that has my heart, the place where I am fed by my spiritual leaders. I get my word from, my inspiration from, lifting Encourage, empower, equip. We lift every morning on Devo Energy. That's what lifting is, by encouraging people, by empowering people. We had flipping females, and shout out to Tiffany and her crew. They did a phenomenal job a week and a half ago at the Flipping Female Conference on how to flip properties and get involved in real estate. What did she do? She empowered. She said, here's the information I learned. I am not going to keep it to myself. I'm going to place it in your hands so now you can become powerful in what you desire and equip. Number three, we lead by instructing, practical instructions. This is why you got to join Pathway to Purpose. This is why I'm excited for you to hear more about Rock City Plus. It's instruction, invite, inviting people to be a part of all of our worship experiences, investing in what God is doing in our community. This is why we have the school. This is why we're trying to do more with our nonprofits so we can be an investment into the communities that we love. Hear me when I say this, past problems should lead to present compassion. Past problems should lead to present compassion. Can I ask you a question? What bothered you growing up and what has been a problem in your life that you don't want nobody else to experience. It's not hard. I got it. It's not hard. Pastor Mike, growing up, I can remember we had to wait on food stamps and we had to wait on, on all of a sudden they just give us that big old block of cheese and it was horrible and I couldn't stand the way they treated us and said so-and-so, so-and-so. Then you should love to be a part of helping people get groceries. Your past problem should lead to present compassion. Pastor Mike, I remember what it was like to grow up without a father, and glory be to God, I made it out all right. I would hate for somebody else to do that. Then you should be a mentor. Your past problem should lead to present compassion. I've said it once, and I'll say it again. Your misery becomes your ministry, and your pain becomes your reason for living. 
Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of bad people, but the appalling silence of good people. There's a law that they're trying to get passed right now where they will stop teaching certain parts of history. And in my heart, I believe it's simply because those who were silent during that time don't want their ancestors in history to record their negligence. Can I ask you a question? What will your legacy be in your circle? Will your nieces and nephews remember you as the one who loved everybody or the mean one? I want a Christ-like legacy. In the morning, verse 35, we're going home. He took out two silver coins and gave, the, gave them to the innkeeper, who would be the hotel manager, saying, take good care of him. Care of him. And if it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on the way back. In other words, can I modernize, McClurize, and contemporize it? Whatever he need, give to him. I got it. Look at verse 36 and 37. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell in the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, as I say to you, go and do the same. Everything I've read to you is not just a scripture in the Bible. It is red letter. It is what Jesus was saying. He told this story when he was explaining on how to be a neighbor. Love your neighbor. I hope you understand the unique opportunity we have as a church. That if we're going to be a mega church, we got to do some mega stuff. And this weekend, I mean this from the depths of my heart. I want us to go above and beyond. Look, do me a favor. Look at that right there. We feel arenas. There were more people in that room than we can imagine. We've done that. Look, look at this right here. We've performed on some of the biggest stages in the world. You see that? We went to other states and toured and did concerts. Now is not a time for calling people to us. It is a time for us to go to people. And I am asking each and every one of you to say, Pastor Mike, I got it. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that their heart has been convicted and challenged to be what you've called them to be. I pray that we will not look at people as something to exploit, something to avoid, or not just be curious, but we will be moved to compassion to make a difference. It's in Jesus' name, amen.